if I can start with just some sort of minor questions, just to, to get an idea of, uh, of your background and why you chose to go into art. Um, were you uh, always focused on art as a child? Um, I think I was always creative as a child, but I definitely wasn't, uh, certainly wasn't focused on art when I was at school. I did art and I really enjoyed it. But I also was good at sciences and English as well. So I kind of, I, yeah, I just, I, I kind of applied for lots of different things at university. But I suppose I did have, I really enjoyed the time that I spent in the art room. So I think I had very influential art teachers. We also had a neighbour who was an art teacher, not at my school. Uh, and my mum and dad were, to my young self, very, very square. Like they hadn't gone to, uh, they hadn't had any higher education. Uh, they were very ambitious for their children, I would say. They were very ambitious for us all to go to university. I've got a brother and a sister who didn't go to university. But so by the time it got to me, I think they were very focused that I should be going to university. But I think I just was really drawn to it because it was very different to my upbringing. There were no other artists in our family and other than the neighbour, we didn't know any other artists and it wasn't, I grew up in a house with no books and it kind of, it just, it, I was just so drawn to these different lifestyles that I was really aspiring to, I suppose. Were you, um, you're educated in Glasgow? Yep. And uh, was it a state school or private school? Did you? No, not private school. No, I went to, it was a very good school. I went to state school, but I went to Catholic girls school called Notre Dame High School. So which is now not just for girls. But no, we went to state school. But again, I think my mum was quite uh, snooty about what school we went to. It was the local school, but uh, she wanted, she was very clear. She wanted us to go there. Um so it was very nice school, but it was comprehensive and there was a big mix of intake, a really broad mix. I think when I was in sort of first or second year, there's a big Catholic private school in Glasgow called St Aloysius, which initially was only for boys. But when I, I think when I was in about first year, it switched because a lot of the boys from my primary school, which was a state primary school, some of them went to St Aloysius. But when I was in about first or second year, St Aloysius let in girls. So there's quite a lot of girls were just removed from Notre Dame to go to St Aloysius. So you were at St Aloysius? No, no, I wasn't. Well, you no, didn't no, go. I stayed. No, no. <laughs> but some of the, a lot of other girls who were from families that sent their sons to St Aloysius, they did go. Because I think in the olden days of Glasgow, you sent your sons to St Aloysius and your girls to Notre Dame. Yeah. Although my dad went to, he went to St Mungo's, which is a state school, but had quite a strong kind of network of uh, pupils at all well he played rugby so he kind of there was quite a gang of them and I've noticed that like at his funeral they have the, they, you know they seem to kind of look out for people who they went to school with my uncles went to St Mungo's actually and my my mum was from the east end of Glasgow so yeah. yeah Notre Dame has a great name and actually you were you were mentioning earlier when we were chatting that you were had an opportunity to go and study other things rather than art when you went to university but you chose art instead of a profession as such although art <laughs> is a profession you'll have to excuse me yeah but it's a different kind of profession it's not quite so focused you know if you get a degree I do think it would benefit everybody to go to art school no matter what you go on to do with your life a good friend of mine Peter McCahey says that he always says what you should really be thinking is why would you not go to art school not why would you because it's just the best experience for dismantling all the things that you think you know but when I went to Glasgow School of Art my year group and my friend's year group for the years ahead of me it was still very west of Scotland it was very different to uh, the way Glasgow School of Art is now and all uh, what I can see other art schools in Scotland and and universities um, so we had quite a we were sort of we were the smart kids from our years that were also good at art that 
many of us, there was a few folk whose parents were art teachers, but really not that many. We all came from backgrounds where people didn't have any connection to art, but because it was state-funded higher education, it was like, well, of course you should go if you get in because you're not going to run up enormous debts. So if we were going to run up enormous debts like students have to now, then I probably would have done the law degree that I was accepted into at Glasgow Uni or the architecture degree that I got into at the MAC. But at that point, we were very, very lucky mm -hmm. uh, that you didn't have to contemplate getting into debt mm -hmm. to do your degree. You just had to have a part-time job and you could fund it yourself. Yeah, it made a massive difference. Um, you mentioned earlier the, this idea that um, it would behove any profession to have actually studied some aspect of art in the process. I, I had an opportunity to do a year in Australia, and one of the things that the medical uh, department and the law department did was at the College of Fine Art, they did a modules. Every student had to do modules in art. But we don't seem to have that facility in our universities at all. No, no. I think in some, now that my kids are at university... I think you have you, you do have options to do modules, but I think that kind of creative dismantling of thought processes and not being reliant on words and oh, there's all sorts of reasons why going to art school is a fantastic thing. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that I think now because particularly within Glasgow, there's a kind of there's an economy of artists that you can go to art school, you can be at school and be pointed out to. Uh, artists who are earning a living living in Glasgow as artists like like I am and my husband is and my friends are but when I was at art school that was really rare it was just the sort of the, the sort of Sandy Moffat's painting students were coming through so there was that group and we were very we didn't sort of see ourselves as like them we didn't want to do figurative painting and so didn't want to go down that that route but still were looking at ways that you could earn your living so now it's something that is at, you, you you can never be what you can't see so people can see that that you can be an artist in Glasgow when I was at school it, you had no idea what the idea of becoming an artist was I didn't even know what that was it was just to do something to continue to be creative and then so now I think there's much more pressure to become a famous conceptual artist or whatever and I think that's that's really difficult for students. There's so many more students going through art school as well. But from my year, there was like a midwife, a policewoman, eventually. You know, not straight away, but within sort of five years. Art isn't for everyone, but the methods of thinking about art and thinking about the world through art are useful for everyone. I think that's a, and that's a very pertinent point. And you um, ended up with the environmental art department with David Harding, yep, I believe. I did. Now, he was a formative figure clearly yeah a lot of people who seem to come through that department have had tremendous success um how did you find working with with david i mean did it change your way of thinking or uh yeah i think it it was there was david and there was also sam ainsley who was very influential and i think that david had a very clear idea of what he wanted his department to be and i think sometimes that's overlooked that it was like you know we all were all just doing whatever we wanted to but the course that we did was a public art course and i think for me that was so important in the the, the the fundamental difference to environmental art to any other of the departments within fine art in the art school when i was there and i think it probably continues through to this day is that we had to do a public art project so we had to engage with people who weren't within the art school from your very first year in environmental arts. So you had to go and talk to someone else about what you wanted to do. You had to get permission. You had to negotiate with people who, who were not your tutors and who were not your colleagues. I mean, it could be your pal if you wanted to do it in their front garden. But I mean, I was off negotiating with bus shelter companies when I was in third year. Let's say I'd be like 20, 21 getting a bus out to Cumbernauld to find the offices for the company that ran the adverts in the bus shelters. And I loved that. I really loved that. Uh, so that isn't, also that isn't for everyone. But I think, so I think it gave you skills and it placed, it, it forced you right from the start to place your art practice in the world. And I think that's always been really important to me and something that I've always really thrived on. Yeah, it turned you into a producer as well in a different manner. 
I mean, you've gone on to make films and you, you work in other aspects, but uh, that must have given you the grounding to do that as well. Absolutely. I think I'd be a very good producer. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I mean, I am a producer. 50% of what I do I mean, is fundraising, production. Those skills can be applied to many things, but you get, that's again why art schools are really good grounding. And lots of people go through art school and go on to do very different things but mm -hmm. uh, yeah for me there was there's a lot that I always say it gave you the skills to negotiate the two skills that I think are really important for what I do are to negotiate and also to edit mm -hmm. you have to be very aware of what you what you leave out uh, and that that you build that up you build that experience up over time you don't get that instantly it requires a huge degree of um, subjective sensitivity mind you and it's dealing with people and dealing with their emotions is very much part of the kind of work that you're looking at at the present time. Um, one of the things David Harding has apparently said was that 50% of it is context. So in that framing, um, how much has your work changed depending on the context that you find yourself in? Yeah, well, it was actually a guy called John Berger that oh, said the context okay. is half the work. So that was our mantra in the oh, department. Was it? it was, uh, yeah, you have to. And now I think... I'm not wholly sold on that. I think, and now it took me a long time to kind of come around to the fact that you can make an artwork and show it in different situations. I, I don't fully agree with that, and I've had plenty of arguments with David about that. But I think the context of the work is a huge consideration. Uh, and I think that's something that it, you you kind of always think about. But I think an artwork, quite a lot of works that I make are in museums and they move around and I'm not with them when they move around now. And I, I think what you have to, it has to be able to stand up on its own and it has to be able to communicate to, I like something that can communicate to different audiences because you can't, you can't continuously tell people what they have to think about something. Mm -hmm. They have to make that decision. They have to come to that themselves through looking at the artwork. So, yeah. Your, um, your art practice, obviously, when you left university, you left the art college, it was very much based in social cooperation and, and meeting with people. And as you're describing, um, I think there was one done with, it was a lap dancing club in Edinburgh? Or? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. In the college, yeah. <laughs> in the college. In the sculpture court of the college. It was brilliant. <laughs> and how did you, how did you organise that particular? Uh, I organised it because I wanted to, get some live it was called live acts i think uh, live breaks live breaks is what it was called um, well i kind of I, I i think i came upon i made that work in the same way that i make a lot of works i use i'm, I'm a bit of a, a a kind of knowledge junkie of i would say i like to find out about things that i don't know about and round about the art college i was teaching at the art college and i also um I had the opportunity to finish an MFA that had started in America, but I hadn't finished it. So I was had been going up to the campus for a year or two, and, and it's the campus is famous for having these uh, topless stripper bars round about. And I'm not that easily intimidated, but I didn't really feel like they'd be the sort of place I would go into myself. So I had, because I was doing this MFA, I had tutorials with Bill Scott, the late, great Bill Scott, who had been head of sculpture. And by then he was sort of part retired, and I said, right, well, if I'm going to do this, why don't we have a tutorial? And if we're going to have a tutorial, could we have it in one of these bars? Because you could come with me. Because I'd, I'd, I think I would be less, I think it would be better to go in with someone or to go in with a man, basically. I didn't really want to go in myself. And I, of course, as it turned out, when they were in, it's totally unintimidating. <laughs> and, uh, but what I was really taken with was the kind of tiny amount of space that the dancers had and the kind of architecture of the bar and they're kind of like dancing on a shelf. It's this tiny and it's all about holding the viewer. And yeah, so I was kind of quite taken with that and wanted, and because they were so close to the art school, they do a lot of sitting around. They're not always dancing. They're very small amount of time they're actually dancing because it's to get people to come in and drink. That's what they're there for. It's like showing football on the television. So um, I asked them if they would come and have their breaks on this big scaffolding platform that I built in the sculpture court. Well, how did you find when you met the girls? Uh, how did you really? They just appeared to be very, very ordinary people. Basically. Totally ordinary, yeah. yeah to, I've got some really nice photographs actually that I keep meaning to exhibit. That uh, Alan Dimmick, who's a good friend of mine, who's been photographing my events for years that he took when they came in to have a meeting about the work and like two of them have got their kids with them and buggies and one girl's a student and yeah they're just just completely mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Just ordinary women. I'm not, I, I don't know if I would, yeah, there's a whole lot of discussion around why you would do it and is it a decent way to earn part-time wages and I'm not going to get involved in that argument. But they were just completely, the whole thing was completely ordinary. I think what you do beautifully is you collapse the walls around people and you show the person and their personality and the compassion and kindness that's needed around these kind of, you know, just people in general. We should extend that to each other rather than judge. And your work seems to do that very, very well. You spoke about something in, actually it was the GOMA interview, and you were talking about um, the ebb and flow of your work, of your art. And I really loved that idea of, um, as a woman artist, the world that you can find yourself in if, as a mother and, you know, just life in general. And uh, I think you described something which was a line of, of light and above it you had the external work and below it the internal work. So domestic perhaps and, you know, your, your artwork out into the world and how it sort of seemed to flow in some kind of a, a wavelength pattern in a way. Um, yeah, there's certainly no straight lines. No. It's not. I think people think it's a continuous line from art school that you're just going up and up and up or else you go down and down and down. There's not any... And I think particularly for women, it's just an entirely unstraight and bending road. But it's, yeah, there's many, many bends to it. It, it actually made me feel so much better about my art practice because I've made choices at different points where I had to just put it to the side as I got my daughters through exams and through life in general and through moving house or renovating something. And when you said that in this in this interview, I thought, my God... We, uh, we have these views that everything is external and outward and professional. And the truth is our lives aren't like that at all. Mm. Um, which brings me actually also to more recently, your more recent work, which um, streamed from something that was occurring in your family. And it's this coined phrase, Psy Art. Can you tell me something about the Psy Art <laughs> movement and, and how you got into it? Yeah, well, I can start by saying I think the sci art term is really problematic. <laughs> I wrote part of a PhD thesis <laughs> dismantling it. Did it's you? very... Um, the, the, the term was coined through funding organisations to combine funding that would fund artists who had some interest in science and wanted to in some way connect with it. But it's been around since Leonardo da Vinci was working. You know, it's that idea of having a singular brain or a brain that can accommodate more than one thing. Mm -hmm. And most of us have brains that can accommodate more than one thing. So there's no reason why you shouldn't have an interest. You, you know, I find the term a wee bit annoying because you wouldn't have like kind of, kind of geography art or uh, like, you know, it's just like it seems to be the, the, the kind of, combination of the two names artists make work about loads of things I think sometimes there's a bit of a a road that you can go down where the sci art terminology and the field is seen as a way to illustrate science which I do think is a valid area of work but I, I don't see that as what I'm there to do I don't I think but I think that is something that often is taken up by particularly by scientists or by and also now that I work a bit in an academic setting with a research funding you know everybody wants public engagement and everybody wants this broader view of what they do and everybody wants to be able to involve the public in their scientific work and that's a, an important ask of anyone who's getting kind of public research funding but uh, that isn't all. You can't just hand that to an artist at the end. You have to bring artists in at the mm -hmm. beginning. Same as if you're commissioning public art for your, your buildings. So I, I got involved in it through, through initially being invited to apply for some funding uh, because there was a fund that was run by the Wellcome Trust that was funding artists to collaborate with scientists. And I was asked if there was anything I ever thought of that I might want to do that would be relevant for this fund because uh, I think they hadn't funded very many things in Scotland. Um, and my sister at that point had quite recently been diagnosed with a form of muscular dystrophy that we found out when her daughter was born, who was very premature. She already had a son who was four. And they were all diagnosed with this inherited neuromuscular disorder. Uh, so she suggested, well, why don't you see if you can find out some more, find out somebody who works with this. So that that was that really was initially how I got into it was <laughs> chasing funding. But with I was kind of interested to have this conversation with my sister as well, who's not an artist and isn't interested in art at all. But 
I was kind of saying, well, why don't you try and see if we can find out some more about this? So I did. Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny because I'd never heard the term sci art until I started to look at your work and it was yeah. only and you don't claim it and no. you know quite rightly but what I found really interesting was the way that in the Wellcome Trust blurb that they've got they talk about observational analytical rational and then the artistic which is more subjective and you know in many ways it's absurd there's no question that it's absurd um but as you say, if you can get funding and if you can get company governments governance so that they're going to push, push the you know the connection with people and the connection with the individual, which seems to me, to it 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 doesn't validate it because it's going to happen anyway in a generalized sense, but it certainly helps the ordinary person make the connection between genetic work to get rid of faulty genes and the amount of funding that it takes to do that. And an end result. I mean, in your particular situation, presumably, there's a huge amount of genetic, um, I wouldn't say engineering, but certainly correcting to try and help with this particular condition. Yeah, there's, I mean, but I've been involved with it for 22 years, I would say. Yeah. And I, there's been enormous change in the, the treatments that are available and the way that the scientists are working and the way that... Uh, they they now have clinical tri trials that are that are in progress around medical programs that will change your DNA. It, so it's quite incredible. It's when the <laughs> vaccines for COVID were brought out. Uh, one of them affects your RNA, and I was like, "Oh, I know what that is. I don't know if I would want that. It's something in my RNA because that absolutely changes your genetic code." Um, but I think one of the reasons there's been such good advances in myotonic dystrophy, which is a particular condition that my family have, is that it's very, very common, but also it's very, very interesting to science because it it, it has certain characteristics that they think could affect everyone at some point because nobody quite understands why you have suddenly have these symptoms kick in because you have a chromosomal disorder that causes part of your DNA to stretch so you have this you have a repeat in the CTG of your genes so scientists find this really fascinating so there was a lot of there's always been a lot of research around it <clears throat> but what I've noticed in the 20 years that I've been involved with it is it's now much more directed to things that are affecting people who have it as opposed to things that scientists find interesting and those two things aren't always the same those two things are very rarely the same That's interesting. and you find that a lot with the involvement of patient activist groups who come who if they're given an opportunity will come together so the myotonic dystrophy community has a really fantastic network of scientists clinicians and patients finally took a long time to get patients involved and they meet every two years. And I think work like the work that I've done and the work that some other writers have done have kind of pushed that agenda a little bit where families have said, you know, actually don't look at that. That doesn't bother us. I've heard that a lot with many conditions. One of the other films that's in, that getting shown at Summer Hall just now deals with another type of uh, condition that causes um uh, children to be very short and actually it's the muscle problems that are affecting those children as they grow into adults the most it's not the fact that they don't attain what is classified as a normal height so with myotonic dystrophy it was really boring things like you fall asleep during the day um, and there's a lot of uh, th there had been no studies of brain connections a lot of addiction there was so many things that were really ruining the lives of families who had this condition that weren't being studied particularly, even for a, a treatment, not a cure, but a treatment to alleviate some of the symptoms or, or social care mm -hmm. to help families who are dealing with it. Uh, so that as that information has been made more public in a number of ways, including my work, um, that has shifted the way that the scientists, what the scientists look at. Certainly in your thesis, the question was something along those lines, wasn't it? If art could influence outcomes for yeah, the scientific yeah. study of, of genetics. Um, there's something in one of your films, it was the, uh, I can't remember which one it was called, but you were interviewing the various scientists involved in examining mm -hmm. the, the genetic coding. And it was anticipation. Yep. Um, and in the present world that we live in, 
with all of these ideas that if you, you know, quantum physics or whatever, if you look at something, you can then, it, 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 it can be changed. And I misunderstood the terminology of anticipation when I first watched it. I thought, what are they saying? Are they saying that because you're paying attention to it, something is going to become worse? And then looking into it, I realised that it's, it's actually, it's, it's this three-year, uh, sorry, three-generation concept. Yeah, yeah. Can you just explain a wee bit about Yeah, well, the three-generation concept is specific to myotonic dystrophy, but an anticipation comes through in a number of conditions. Uh, another one is Huntington's disease that quite a lot of people have heard of, or fragile X syndrome. And it manifests itself differently, but the kind of crux of it is that the, the genetic condition that you pass on to your child gets worse each time it's passed on. That's the simple solution of it. So the type that you have, when you pass it on, the type that your children get is worse, and then the type that their children get is worse again. And that can manifest itself in all sorts of ways. With myotonic dystrophy, what it means is that the symptoms in the first generation adult, we, as we'll call it, which would be my father, are very, very mild. He didn't know he had anything wrong with him. Uh, he didn't have anything wrong with him until he was in his 50s. Uh, and then there was a series of things that were never connected to a genetic issue. But by the time my niece was born, who's his granddaughter, my dad was in his 60s and he did start to have some mild symptoms of the muscle sticking. He had a few problems with his walking. But none of that had been diagnosed and it wasn't particularly problematic. And then my sister, the symptoms that we now associate with the early stages of myotonic dystrophy, she had begun to get those in her 30s, but again, hadn't really made much fuss about them. Uh, but because these symptoms are, are degenerative, in the course of her life, it's getting worse. So, so the type, by the time she had her daughter, she had some very mild symptoms that she hadn't really had any checkups for. But her daughter was born profoundly disabled and very close, very nearly died, which is very common with babies who are born with the congenital form of myotonic dystrophy, which is the worst kind, which is the kind that you have symptoms from birth. So my sister only had symptoms from maybe in her 30s and my dad only had symptoms from maybe in his 50s. So it, the onset is younger mm -hmm. and more severe. And does it? This is going to sound like a daft question, but three mm -hmm. generations, does it end at the end of three generations? More or less, yeah, because my niece won't ever have children. I see. Uh, but it also dies out uh, through a number of reasons, but it's pretty... Uh, the third generation tend not to uh, have children. That, so the, the very severely affected children aren't able to have children, so then it stops because it's not a carrier gene, so it's um, you can't be a carrier. You can't... You can't pass it on to your children without having it. So I don't have it, so none of my children can get it. It's not about me having a partner that gives you the other part of the genetic jigsaw puzzle. That's what's called a recessive genetic disorder. And myotonic dystrophy is a dominant mm -hmm. genetic disorder. So if you have it, you've got a 50% chance of passing it on to your children. So you mentioned earlier about the films in the black box in Summer Hall, uh -huh. and there's three different series of films, Kin 1, 2 and 3, I think, or Kinship 1, 2 and 3, uh -huh. and your films are in the last section. So um, your way of expressing this particularly, um, well, I mean, what, the inciting incident of a change of your art in some respects, I mean, did it change your art massively when you chose to go down this route of looking at the genetic um, situation? I think it's taken me off on journeys that I maybe wouldn't have made. Um, but I don't think, I think, I think some of the things that I've been interested in through my study of myotonic dystrophy uh, are also there in other works that I do. I don't just make work about genetic conditions. I don't just make work about disability. But even before my family were diagnosed, when I look back, I, I did make work that had ramps in them. <laughs> and I did make work that had railings in them. Uh, and I'm kind of, I've always said uh, that I'm interested in how, because I did my degree in public art, I'm all, I've always been interested in how people navigate public space. And I think in many ways, the work that I've done around myotonic dystrophy is just using that those same 
rules and questions as other artworks I make which look at how people navigate space and how people are perceived in public. Mm. So the, the Hazel film was very much about how you judge people by what their appearance is, which happens to women all the time, whether they've got a disability or not. It doesn't. So it, just yeah. to, to talk a wee bit about Hazel, um, it's a really poignant and beautiful film. It's very, very well filmed. You've really... It's very crisp in the way that you've got the two boxes of... So you have the, the affected sister, technically, and the unaffected sister. And I love the fact that the unaffected sister, despite clearly being affected in some other ways, is silent. Mm. Um, and I really wanted to ask you about that. Um, going back to the concept of ebb and flow that you, you spoke about earlier, or at least I spoke about on your behalf earlier... Can you ever be unaffected, despite the fact that you are not mm. suffering from the genetic situation? You're affected in some other ways, and I was really interested in how you. Yeah, I think I think this. that is something that it, you find with most inherited uh, genetic. Well, if it's inherited, it's genetic. With most inherited conditions, it doesn't just affect the person who has it. It affects everyone in that family, whether they have it or not. Right at the very beginning, I made the very first artwork I made was a little artist book called DM that uh, had uh, lots of photographs of people who I'd encountered in this first year of diagnosis of my niece. I was pregnant at the time, so I also had my son. Uh, and it's just these photographs, and there's a little bit of text by me. But what it kind of shows is, and I always say this book shows people who have been affected by myotonic dystrophy, and my mum's in it. And I think out of everyone in my family, my mum has almost been affected the most, and she doesn't have it. Just two of her children do, her husband did, her grandchildren do. And I think, yeah, it, it, it sucks people in, and it, 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 it takes up so much time, it takes up so much energy. And it, it, people lose their place within society because of that. And it's something that I've been really aware of with my own family, that you, you sort of slip, you earn less. I, I did a, a speech to, at a fundraiser for this big American foundation now that raises a lot of fin do fantastic work. And they had a fundraising dinner in London and I was asked to speak at it. And it's when all the, I think it was Morgan Stanley, get their executive bonuses and they have to donate some of it to charity and I remember kind of writing it and thinking do you know that is really something that you don't think about you think about the health issues but it takes up so much time caring for family members who have disabilities that you just lose time that you would usually spend kind of in the world uh, so and I think there is a social decline not just with myotonic dystrophy not just with uh genetic conditions but with poor health it mm. takes up so much time that you lose that time and so I think I think health outcomes are really critical to look at because of course poverty affects that so much as well you know if you if you earn a lot and you're you are diagnosed with a genetic illness in your family you can just about manage you probably will have to change I know people who've had to change jobs because they couldn't cope with the amount of time that their children needed and but you're still earning okay money. But if you start, if you embark on that journey from a very low income point, it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I find the um, when the the people who were affected were speaking, it was very, very poignant. But it was actually the stillness of the other women in their eyes, reading in their eyes, and reading in the the um, almost the they weren't absent, but they're 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 view their um their look was slightly removed but incredibly powerful because it was almost like you could read the pain of mm. almost like a guilt is it i, I wouldn't say anybody feels guilty yeah. but guilt's a funny one some people get guilt really badly and some people don't i don't know um i think there was guilt in the moment of the filming because i filmed the silent shot at the end of the interview where i'd interviewed the unaffected sister about their sister who and in a lot of cases they hadn't seen their sisters very recently <laughs> they weren't filmed at the same time and they weren't not all of them were particular some of them were very close but not all of them were and I think there was elements of that where I was asking them to speak about something that they hadn't thought about for a long time I asked everybody the same questions both sisters and all the sisters I more or less asked them all exactly the same 
questions. So I think there was a reflective moment at the end of filming where I asked them if I could just leave the camera on and left the room and filmed them. So you would be thinking around what you'd just been talking about. But I think for me it was very powerful filming the unaffected sisters because they, I had a lot in common with them, they had a lot in common with me, not deliberately so, but uh, there was a few of the interviews where one, one of the sisters, does. I ask all the sisters to describe their sister and uh, one of the affected sisters was describing her her sister and said, you know, she's 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 <laughs> she's always telling us what to do. She's very bossy and she's she's very skinny and she's really smart. <laughs> and she and it, when I was I was doing the transcript and describing it to my husband, <laughs> he's laughing his head off. He's like, that's you with your family. <laughs> So it was, it was quite, I found that really, there's a whole other artwork to be made about that that I haven't quite approached. You're, you have an, a beautiful artwork actually where it, you and your sister are on blocks, white blocks, and it's it's put in a, almost a, how would you describe it, almost, well, it's, it's brickwork almost the way that you, you show it, so you've got different movements through it. And it's, it's so subtle and it's so gentle, but shows the problems between, you know, your able-bodied situation, your sister's more compromised situation. And at the end of Hazel, or the bit I saw anyway, you're both walking down through the the corridor. Uh-huh, yeah. And that is, it's really, it's beyond poignant, actually. It's a very, very moving moment. Nothing said, it's just those simple actions of walking mm-hmm. and how your sister's body's clearly sh- changed. Mm-hmm. Um in terms of art and how it reaches people and helps their understanding as a philosophy, if you like, would you be hopeful that this kind of piece, type of art could be shown more widely into schools and into places where to help children understand mm-hmm. the difficulties of, of conditions? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think those those types of works are really important that they get shown. I always said when I made the first film, the Tomorrow Belongs to Me film with the scientists, when they start to get quite excited when they get closer to talking about this discovery. And I remember saying, I said, I want every, I want to show that in all schools so that everybody wants to become a scientist. I don't want people to become artists. I want them to become scientists and get, you know, sort out all these problems that my family and many others have. But yeah, I think I think that is, I think any of these things are important I think you should be able to show any art to children and engage them in a discussion around what it's about. So it's absolutely there to be seen by children to talk about mm-hmm. things. Because the big thing about those, both of those films, but particularly Poe's work for sisters, the one you talked about with the blocks, a lot of that was also, although there's a difference in our movement now, we're also still very alike. And I don't think I'd realised how much alike we were until I went into making that film. Because we'd always been asked if we were twins. Always been very like my sister. I never really saw it, really, but other people did. But actually, when you see the film physically, I think that's what makes it more poignant. It's not like two physically different people separating through their movement. We are physically still very similar. We're both tall thin middle-aged women we've both had children we've both got a bit of a tummy that you can see in on the side shots we just look like ordinary women until the movement starts and that separates us you notice it particularly around the hips and knees actually i mean it really is very and and very like the kind of dancers you would have had bodies like yours and your sisters your tall slim lithe type look and and that is why it becomes almost more even more sort of painful in some ways because you think it must be very, very difficult to have moved into a situation where your muscles are not yeah. helping any longer. Yeah, it's, 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 she, uh, my sister wouldn't be able to do that now. She's deteriorated an awful lot since we made that film. That was about five years ago now that we made it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's also important that you make these records. I've always said right from the early stages of making this work when I go back to it because, you know... it. It sits alongside other artworks that I make, that I've made within the last 20 years, nearly. But I've always said it's important to make things at stages because artworks represent the time that you're at now. So I couldn't go back and make the artworks that I made 20 years ago about this condition in my family because my thought on it now is very, very different. So I think it's... But I'm really glad that I made the work. 
So I think, and I think that can be said about many artworks, they have to be of their time and it's about recording that time and recording that emotional feeling of the time that you're in. Whether things become better or whether they become worse, you don't know how life's going to pan out. And I think that's why it's very important to have these records of, of a time. In saying that, my sister hates them, <laughs> but <laughs> she was very kind and agreed to do the filming with me. I think uh, you, you reference in your in your thesis a couple of filmmakers, actually. One was Karen um, Guthrie. Yeah, yeah. And I actually watched the film. Oh, it's the best. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's just and such a Do you a know, her mother's birthday is today. Really? 25th of April. Ah, right, right. I was really blown away by that. I oh, thought it's such a great film. strange. But it's that, such a great film. And that's the kind of um, ability you seem to show as well with your filmmaking, that you really are capturing something that is speaks to the universal condition, but at the same point is very specific. Can you see your movement towards more documentary-style work, or are you going to be specifically remaining in the art dynamic mm. of gallerist? Concepts. I, I don't. I don't know if I would. I. I don't want to discount anything that I might do, mm -hmm. to be honest. Uh, but I think I don't just make films, and I like to make sculptures, and I like to draw. So I make all sorts of art. That some of it's more kind of object based, or kind of fits in a room. <laughs> Uh, and at the moment, I don't have any desire to make a documentary, particularly not a documentary about my family. Through my work as a, as a family advocate, I've seen quite a lot of documentaries that have been made with families who have the condition. And I, I feel that that's not what I want to do. There's a lot of fundraising films get made where, that are to raise money and they have a natural kind of task that they have to accomplish. So they have to make you cry. They have to make you put your hand in your pocket to donate to the charity as they should but I don't see that as what I want to do and I think that was why I was quite I was very very careful about Hazel the the way that what excerpts are used from these interviews and the fact that it is women and it is middle-aged women they go from 28 to 78 I think more or less so it covers a stage in life where women aren't often seen on screen and also the fact that there's no children in it there's no cuteness in it I, I kind of quite deliberately I think my mum always despairs like I, I make things that are quite deliberately have one step removed that are quite minimal and and then you have to bring some emotion to it I don't want it to be just all up there straight away I noticed that in the Goma interview you did you spoke about that and you didn't want people to be prescribed emotion uh -huh. through a yeah. process which is really admirable to, to manage to do that to keep it in such a place it's just held so that people mm -hmm. can read what they choose to from it because some people are hugely emotional and some people yeah. You could hit them and they wouldn't do anything. So from that point of view, yeah, you really do achieve what you're aiming for without making it far too um, emotional and you know pulling on the heartstrings. I think once you get to the stage of observing that in filmmaking, it becomes really tiresome to be manipulated to that degree or to be manipulated through music. And you don't use any of these techniques, which is... Is really quite I, I think that's why I hate the term sci art. Whenever I hear the term sci art in my head, I hear that sort of jingly jangly kind of synthesizer music and multicolored. I hate all that. I, th I think it, there's so much in art that's aesthetic and there's so much in art that is taste. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, I have a way of dressing that other people in the street do not dress like and vice versa. So I, I just think everyone should be able to have their aesthetic and there's different things that people get out of art. People sometimes people want to have everything right there and I just I think it's a kind of it's a broad church and it, rightly it should be. But I do think for the the element I always think about the emotion that I want to come across from an artwork. I always think about how I want people to feel right from the very, but that's one of the first things I think about, whether that's like a big public sculpture out on a hillside in a Glasgow housing estate or a, a commission in Oslo or a small film for a museum show. All of these things I do think quite carefully about how I want people to feel it looks like I do try and choreograph it a little bit so that 
how I want people to feel is very important, but I have one way of doing it, and mm -hmm. other people will have others. You mentioned patient advocate you know, for yeah. this genetic dynamic, but you're almost like an art advocate in a strange way, the way that you're describing this. Um, another thing that was online was the 12 things for Christmas for the fruit market, and you suggested a large table for everybody yeah. to sit around. Okay. And it's this conversation, this negotiation, yeah, yeah. this constant cooperation that seems to be expressed through your art mm -hmm. without any emotions put on it in any sort of slightly um, manipulative way. Uh, did you sort of miss the opportunity in some ways by not becoming a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> is, is being a lawyer all about getting people around the table? It um, can be about negotiation. Entertaining more than them. It is. <laughs> Is it entertaining them? Are you certainly well, my brother-in-law is an advocate. Well, he's not, he's not. He was an advocate. And I remember when he was talking about his training, uh, he had to get voice coaching and, and you've got the courtroom. And I've been, I used to, I mean, that was what I wanted to do when I was a child. I used to love all these courtroom dramas. And uh, um, yeah, so I, I just, uh, I think that holding, holding a room and holding an audience, I don't do live performance. I'm not very good performer but I, I wish I was if I could sing I would be up there singing uh, yeah I think so I think there is there's crossovers uh, around how you manipulate people and how you I don't think I manipulate people but I think I, I like to be able to guide people but uh, so there are definitely crossovers um, so I don't know maybe I'll I'll go the opposite way to you and I'll become a lawyer do you know, it's a funny thing, but I mean, I genuinely think I would be a better lawyer now having been an artist yeah. than I was yeah. before. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the, the table talk, negotiation, all the rest of it, mm -hmm. you know, is that question, the, the question you ask a person, knowing what the answer is going to be, is that technically a manipulation? Is it a leading question? I think these are all moot points, but the point about it is it's the engagement and the talking to people. And that seems to be the, the, the biggest benefit of your art practice is you don't do it in a void, you're doing it through sharing and cooperating and speaking and meeting with society. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a, an inbuilt aspect of your being. Yeah, but I'm not always there. You know, like, I have to put the artworks out and let other people form an engagement or let other people speak on my behalf. You know, it's, if it's in a museum, then you've got very well-trained staff who are there to talk to the public and they've got their notes and I sometimes talk to them and advise them about how they can talk to people. But I'm not there all the time when my artworks are being shown. So, but that's another good discussion around the importance of public museums and having places where people can go and see it. You shouldn't need to just have me standing next to it, telling you what to think. You should be able to go in and have someone else giving you their opinion of it. And yeah, it, it's, so that is the difference, I think, because when a lawyer is making an argument, he has to convince the, the jury to take his side of the argument. And I'm not quite putting out a clear argument in the way that a, a lawyer is. I, I like there to be points where you can come and go and points where you can disagree. So it's probably, there is a lot, it is a big negotiation, but there's also a part of it that is not, it doesn't have to be didactic and it doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't have to win in the way that the, the legal system is so set up in a binary way about you know you're either right or you're wrong. There's nothing in between. That's the court side of the it. Court and side then of the court side of it. Ninety percent is negotiation. Well, that true. Ever sees. true. Yeah, to not get to court. Well, yeah. that's true. So there probably is. I suppose it's a bit like, and I suppose that again is a bit like there was like an iceberg. There's a bit that you see, which is the public part in the museum, and then there's a massive bit underneath. That's all the negotiation of getting the work to a completed stage. Uh, like for me, I, you know, that can involve working with like 50 people. Uh, so there's all, and that's negotiation as well. Like I recently made a film, which has nothing to do with genetics, but still, I, I mean, I see all these works as fitting together. They all go into the same books or should be able to go into the same books. Um, but I made a film with 20 mainly women, but um, doing this very sort of, Scottish pub dance, Scottish wedding dance called the Slosh, and you know the work to get that done in a pandemic. My God, I can't believe we finished it actually, but you know that's a huge amount. Of persuading people to do things on your behalf. I do think 
I spend a lot of time persuading people to do things for me. Things oh. that are like what they do, but not quite what they would use, how they would usually do it. Or the context they'd normally yeah. do it in. Yeah. So that's amazing. So you've got somebody, 20 women doing the slosh together. Yes. Where's this going to be shown? It's been shown. It was down in Folkestone uh, for a big a summer festival called Folkestone Triennial. So it's on a massive screen in an old disused gasworks. You have to look that one up. I think there's bits on YouTube you can see. But it was it was mainly filmed from above using a drone so that the dancers, they're not professional dancers. They're just sort of, again, it's like, women from uh, the oldest participant I think is 82 and there's some young art students in it and it's just a real eclectic mix of people which is exactly what you would get at a wedding I thought it was quite a good assimilation of a wedding crowd uh, and it, it's filmed with a drone so they're in this sort of grid formation um, and uh, because of the pandemic we had to film it outside on a football pitch because <laughs> we weren't allowed to film it we, we couldn't it was illegal to gather women <laughs> together. I wanted older people as well, so it was you had you weren't allowed to do that for over a year. So it was done on a, a sort of sports pitch outside. That's going to stand the test of time. I mean, at that moment, that juncture yeah. with the pandemic. Yeah, I think so. I, can't, I haven't. It's still quite new, so I haven't done any artist talks about it. But I think it would make quite good because yeah, we had to have PA system blasting out all the like um, the music that you do the slosh to, <laughs> and then it started to rain. And yeah, there was all sorts of logistics. But again, I think many people will. There's a whole era of adaptions that we've all made because of the pandemic that everybody's had to change things. So that film is a record of that time. Actually, it's interesting because your uh, black box, you know, the films that are in the black box at the moment, a few of them are talking about viruses and how the virus is enemy or it can be a benefit. Mm -hmm. And of course, you mentioned earlier this idea of the mRNA within the vaccines, yeah, whether or not yeah. it's a good or a bad thing. And there's a, a, a view in certain camps that all viruses can actually take us to a better version of what a human being is. Yeah. So it's interesting know. to know whether or not this has actually come here to assist or... By taking the vaccine, well, it's us, true. You know? uh, my my right from the early days, I met. I've got it's a good friend now. The scientist that I initially worked with, a guy called Darren Moncton, and I occasionally we meet up and we have a beer and we kind of level everything out and keep up with what each other. So I hadn't seen him since the pandemic, and then we met and had a drink, and he was saying a virus will never kill its host. <laughs> so that's the that's the boss, that's the baseline rule, because if the virus kills its host, then the virus dies. So he's saying it'll never, it's, it's, it was too strong at first. So it, it was killing its host. So the virus has to adapt yeah. to not kill its host. Yeah, it was a um, general, I yeah. think if people could view it in, in a, I mean, without getting any into any political issues here, there was a question of personal choice also in all of this and how much was out in the news and how much was mm -hmm. being, you know, people wanted to believe different things, but... Yeah, the virus stuff in the summer hall is very, very interesting to see. Those little films are really fascinating to see. And they and they fit well with this greater genetic concept of what actually occurred with you know with your situation. So in terms of the slosh, how does that fit with your um most recent works? Uh, it fits exactly because it's recording people doing something it's recording people engaging with a space and it it, it relates back to some, some earlier works of mine where I did used to use music a lot I used to I did a lot of sound works I did a show at Tramway that was mainly like a film soundtrack there was just these little speakers all around the walls of Tramway and again it's about that emotional pull I wanted when I made the film for Folkestone I was looking at all the dance floors that had existed in the town which is one of these resorts that people used to go to a lot more than they do now but you still get a lot of coach parties that go to these resorts to dance they like the big dance floors that are a remnant from the heyday mm -hmm. of when they were that was the only place you would go and my grandmother went on a lot of these coach trips she loved to dance so I said right from the start, I wasn't sure what I was going to make, but I wanted to make something that made people want to dance. It makes me think about the my um, my mum and my aunt Lily and various people. They were all war babies, uh -huh. maybe like your grandmother yeah, yeah. in Glasgow. <laughs> and um, there were no men to dance with, so they all danced yeah. with each well, other. Well, that's the slosh is one that at a wedding. Uh, I think it's quite West Coast, if you didn't, but... Um, 
it, it's mainly women that do it. You don't need a partner. So it's a little bit like a line dance, but I don't like saying it's a line dance because the more you research it, there's quite a lot of dispute over its roots. So it kind of probably came out as much of northern soul as line dancing. But there is that that fundamental aspect that you don't need a partner so it's you, you don't you just it's, you stand in a line and what happens is when they play certain music that it's that everyone dances to it like Tony Christie and things everybody everybody gets up and there'll always be one I always say middle-aged women but now I'm a middle-aged woman so it's like older women <laughs> that know it um, they'll start organising people into where they have to stand and you'll get few people that know it really well and then other people that are trying to follow along the actions uh, so it's a bit and it, it it's a really kind of i i like think it's very there are no anyone can do it and nobody's being excluded which to me yeah. is quite important it's but very it's community based isn't it and the idea of a wedding and, and the slosh and just that feeling about glasgow at a certain point it really does speak volumes mm. Um, yeah. Well, Jackie, thank you so much. That's a fantastic conversation, and I hope it's actually really helpful to people to understand how varied art can be because it's not really just the decoration on a wall, it's so vast, and it can make such a difference to people's lives. By the sense of what you're saying, it's made a big difference to the people who've got this form of degenerative disease. <laughs>